Uh, yeah, so I usually work with like more near maps vibe stuff, but I kind of was working on something very different. And so it might be a little bit out there, but I wanted to tell you guys anyways. Um, it's not difficult to do an intro for brainstem work because everybody knows what the brainstem is. Any neuroscience intro course, any neuroanatomy textbook, a big chunk of that is about the brainstem. Um, but unfortunately, it's also like one of our favorite brain regions to ignore. Or I should say we, like for me, is one of my favorite brain regions to ignore until now. Um, or to represent as like a single brain region, which is crazy because it's such a heterogeneous structure. Um, much of what we know comes from animal work, lesion studies, ex vivo brains, and is limited to specific nuclei and pathways. And this is obviously great in many, in many cases and it lets us know a lot about the anatomy, but it means that we have this big lack of our understanding of brainstem function in the context of like a living human. So a lot of what we know about brainstem function um, it's very biased towards like evolutionarily conserved functions because of course we're studying them in either dead people or um, animals and so we don't have so much of a sense of what's going on in the living brain. Okay, so in my case I'm still a little bit of a cortical centric person unfortunately. So I'm still reframing this brainstem work. It's going to be centered around the cortex. The really big question is, you know, let's take all what, or let me take all what I think I know about the about cortical function and then how does that change when I extend my perspective and I also include the brainstem which is usually excluded. So there's a reason why we don't know much about in vivo uh, brainstem function and of course that's because imaging in the brainstem, functional imaging in the brainstem is extremely difficult. Um, one of the maybe easier sides of it or one of the easier challenges to overcome is the fact that there is no or used to not be a complete atlas or template of the brainstem. So people who are interested in brainstem imaging, they would uh, look at the one specific nucleus they want to look at, they would delineate that themselves, which is a kind of time intensive process, and then look at connectivity patterns between that one nucleus and the rest of the probably cortex. But there wasn't like a standardized template and so we couldn't really look at whole brainstem connectivity and it certainly wasn't very standardized or, or um, reproducible. Another thing we need for brainstem imaging is high spatial resolution and high sensitivity. So these nuclei are really small, so we're going to need slices that are really close together so that you can um, see the, the, nucle the nuclei all together instead of kind of blurring it out into one big voxel or one big uh, brain area. And then very importantly, we need some extensive physiological noise reduction pipelines because of course, as you know, the brainstem is so close to cerebral spinal fluid, it's close to the vasculature. Um, did you know, I didn't know this before I started working on this project, but every time your heart beats, your brainstem wiggles a little bit so you can imagine how difficult it would be to do any functional imaging there. So that's where Marta Bianchardi comes in. She's amazing. She's a um, professor at Harvard and she's really dedicated her career to brainstem, or, uh, brainstem neuroimaging in general, uh, both, fu both functional and structural. I'm just going to be talking about function here. So one thing she started doing was delineating in M9152 template space all these different brainstem nuclei. Um, so for example, here I'm showing you in red the dorsal raphae and in blue the periaqueductal gray. Maybe you guys already know what these things look like, but I didn't. I, I know that these are nuclei, but I'd never really seen, oh, okay, the, the dorsal raphae is this long skinny thing. I didn't know that. Um, and then what she did later, so those are two nuclei I showed you, but then she like over many, many years delineated more and more. So now there's a total of 58 brainstem nuclei. And then very recently, just last year, she put out um, the first functional connectivity atlas between the whole brainstem and the whole cortex. So it's no longer just one specific nucleus in the brainstem, it is really quite comprehensive. Um, and this is the data that I'll be working with. So here is what the brainstem looks like. That's 58 nuclei. There are eight in the midline and um, 20, 25 that are bilateral, so left hemisphere, right hemisphere. I'm mostly, mostly going to be plotting it as uh, centroid coordinates here. It's just a bit easier to see, but I wanted to also show you the volume so you know what they look like. That's brainstem functional connectivity. Um, right away you can see that the um, signal is, is lower. At any rate, the functional connectivity is lower in the brainstem. This is not surprising. The signal to noise ratio is worse um, when you go that, that, down, um, that far down in the, in the brain. But you can actually see that if I just zoom in on the cortex to brainstem functional connect connectivity, you can see stripes, right, across the columns and across the, the rows, which means that there are these dominant patterns of functional connectivity between brainstem and cortex. And here I'm just showing you um, one thing that I thought was cool is that the functional connectivity from the brainstem to cortex is actually bigger than the functional connectivity within the brainstem, which aligns with our int intuition that the brainstem is really the structure that's projecting out to um, the cortex or down to the spinal cord and the cerebellum, et cetera, uh, instead of being very highly connected within itself. Um, so I looked at dominant patterns, these dominant patterns of uh, cortex brainstem functional connectivity. Here is the brainstem, so the three views, coronal, sagittal, axial, 
Um, and I'm plotting the color and the size of the node is indicating how connected these brainstem nuclei are to the cortex. And what I like about this is that it's, first of all, spatially segregated. You have hubs of cortical connectivity at the top, at the middle, at the bottom, which if you think about it is probably a smart way of trying to be efficiently connected to stuff, right? Like if you were all highly connected to the top of the brainstem, it would, be, it would take you forever to get down to the bottom of the brainstem. But instead, it's, it's aligned like this. And some things that pop out are things like the dorsal raphe, uh, different regions in the reticular formation. And then on the flip side, what are the regions in the cortex that are most uh, functionally connected to the brainstem? This follows a really nice anterior, um, posterior gradient and aligns well with classes of laminar differentiation or cytoarchitectonic classes. I strongly suspect that this is about the underlying structure, both in terms, and you can actually see this both in terms of diffusion-weighted imaging going from these anterior brain regions to the brainstem, but also from track tracing or individual, uh, looking at the projections of individual neurons. Um, from these anterior regions, especially these anterior limbic regions down to the brainstem. So one of my main questions when I first got this work, what well, got this data was I wanted to know, now that I have these 58 brainstem nuclei, can I kind of organize them in a way to see if there are modules of brainstem nuclei that are connected to the cortex in similar ways? So what I do is I make this correlation matrix of brainstem regions by brainstem regions, or brainstem nuclei by brainstem nuclei. And the question is, um, can I organize the brainstem nuclei in a way that they are connected similarly to the cortex? So th what this correlation is telling me is how similar are two brainstem nuclei in terms of how they're connected to the cortex. And I can um, pretty neatly arrange them into five modules. This is what they look like. So again, they're spatially segregated. And then for each of these modules, I looked at, okay, so what is that cortical projection pattern? How are these different brainstem nuclei connected to the cortex? And here, well, there's five in total. I just didn't have space. So here are all five. Um, and what I, what I liked about this is as soon as I saw these cortical um, patterns, cortical activity patterns, they're all super recognizable, right? Like I don't really have to tell you what these cortical networks are doing because you probably know. You can see the somatomotor regions. You can see the limbic regions popping up. You can see these more transmodal um, regions involved in memory. But just for the sake of being a bit more quantitative than that, I, I did a, a cognitive decoding. So for every single one of these um, cortical maps, cortical activation maps, which again is um, connected to specific modules of brainstem nuclei, I correlated this with different uh, brain maps related to different cognitive functions from the neurosynth um, meta-analytic tool. And you can see they really align. So for example, the pink module, um, this is a series of brainstem nuclei in that pink module. They're connected to the cortex in a way that's really aligned with the limbic system. And the terms that show up with that system are things like risk, anxiety, mood, emotion regulation, whatnot. I, I really wanted to understand why is it that these brainstem nuclei are connected to the cortex in this way. And one sort of initial answer to that, but I think makes a lot of sense, is it's probably because of these receptor systems, right? Like I worked with receptors before, so I'm a bit biased in terms of why I looked at this. But so first of all, we have these receptors um, that are distributed throughout the cortex, but more importantly maybe is that we have these brainstem nuclei that are expressing a lot of these neurotransmitters, uh, like neurotransmitters themselves, and then projecting out all over the, the cortex. So I thought, well, probably if you have a brainstem um, module, if you have some nuclei that are synthesizing, synthesizing a lot of, let's say, um, serotonin, then that's going to be related to serotonin rece receptor distributions in the brain. And this analysis is just showing that there is this nice coupling between the receptor that's involved in the cortical pattern and the neurotransmitter that's synthesized in the brainstem nucleus. Um, it takes a bit of time to explain, so I won't, but that's the main takeaway. Then on the flip side, um, so previously I was looking at how are brainstem nuclei similarly connected to the cortex. This is the opposite, how are cortical regions similarly connected to the brainstem. And I actually didn't do any clustering because it, I was using the Schaefer 400 parcellation and that's already org ordered according to um, the um, intrinsic functional networks. So I just took the first gradient of this and it looks exactly like the unimodal transmodal functional gradient that we're very familiar with. Now one thing to point out is that that unimodal transmodal gradient, that's based on cortical-cortical connectivity and it's thought to represent cortical hierarchies and cortical-cortical connectivity. But I'm finding when I just look at brainstem connectivity, and indeed, if I correlate them, actually my brainstem version, which is the one on the y-axis, is much more bimodal than the, than the one that's, that you can derive from cortical cortical connectivity. And so my hypothesis is that the brainstem uh, anchors or seeds the extremes of this gradient, and then the cortical cortical connectivity fills in this gradual shift from unimodal to transmodal brain regions. And then the question is, okay, so for unimodal versus transmodal brain regions, where in the brainstem are they connected? And for the unimodal regions, they're mostly connected to caudal brainstem regions plus the inferior colliculus. And for uh, transmodal brain regions, they're mostly connected to rostral brainstem minus the inferior colliculus. 
Um, so that's all. Um, the main thing is with this really amazing brainstorm data set that Marta Bianchardi and her group has put together over the course of many, many years, um, we can extend our perspective of cortical function to the brainstem now as well. We identify these hubs that represent high connectivity. We identify clusters of brainstem nuclei that really subserve familiar cortical patterns. Um, probably neuromodular, neuromodulatory systems are what's mediating this relationship between the cortex and the brainstem. And finally, this gradient of cortical functional hierarchy is probably also very much related to brainstem. It's, I don't think it's just a cortical phenomena. I think it really is coming from um, more subcortical and brainstem structures. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Are there any one really quick questions? I have one quick chairman's prerogative one, a simple one, I think. Since you're combining data from the brainstem, does the brainstem present any unique registration challenges for you? Yeah, definitely. So not just registration, pre-processing every, everything. So this uh, functional connectivity atlas was very much acquired in a way that's specific to the brainstem. The, like delineating those nuclei is like a whole effort. Try, I mean, not, not by me, by Marta and, and her group. Um, but yes, for sure, it presents a lot of challenges, which is why I couldn't, one thing I wanted to do was just replicate this with like HCP data, a bunch of individuals and just like parcelate it to the brainstem, but that doesn't work because then everything is not aligned and the functional signals are a bit wonky, so yeah. Great, well thank you very much. I think we'll move on. Thank you.